I started as an actor, and so I come from the theater. And that was, as we say, my first career. I grew up in uh, attending a Catholic school, and so I'm sort of steeped in, in the tradition, and I have always loved it and also been challenged by it. And when I think back, and you know, how did I get here, I, I've always felt um, a, a deep sense of a call to holiness, which is not a popular phrase or word that we use a lot uh, in our culture, but I think that's what it was. If I put words on it now, looking back, it was a, a sense of a call that I just, I just wanted to be close to God. And I didn't know what to do with that when I was a child. There really weren't a lot of avenues open. So I began to find my way as, as uh, an artist in the theater, as an actor, as a singer, as a dancer. And, and to do that, you have to touch the human spirit very deeply. And I did that for many years and have a, a bachelor's degree in theater and performed all kinds of places. And at a, at a point, I was teaching a lot of, um, I was teaching classes in acting and movement and mime. And I could see the difference. I was hired by a, a company. They signed me on to send me to places where people ha uh, were of special populations, like uh, children who um, had many physical challenges, children who had emotional difficulties, uh, senior centers, all kinds of places that needed the touch of the spirit, needed uh, artistic encounter. And I did a lot of performances and workshops. And through that, I began to see myself as an artist who could reach out and actually touch people and make a difference um, by their reactions. So it wasn't just me performing and having a great time. It was, oh my gosh, you know, the, the whatever it is that I have that's coming forward is actually making a difference. And doing that, I also was um, volunteering in my parish, and I hadn't gone to a church in many, many years, but by volunteering and becoming one of those people who goes to your house to give communion to the homebound, I had to go through lots of training for that, education in pastoral care and some theology, and that is what just set off um, all kinds of memories of, you know, the, go find your way on this path. Interplay for me is the system of, uh, of uh, joy and affirmation and always looking for the good and being able to change, to improvise, to be in the moment. And that is also something that uh, makes sense to me as a person who meditates and prays, because that's what we do. We pay attention to our thoughts. And this whole idea of the wisdom of the body, it's the wisdom of the body. And it made perfect sense to me uh, coming from the theater. Being an actor, you really have to learn how to use your body as an instrument. It has to be at your beck and call for everything you want to create. And I studied a lot of uh, mime, corporeal mime, and dance. And so being, being so aware of my body, um, the interplay idea of um, really paying attention, one of the, the most important things is noticing. We notice. Uh, notice what's happening. Notice, um, notice your breathing. Breathing is fundamental. <laughs> we breathe in, we breathe out, we pay attention. So the whole idea of paying attention, staying and creating in the moment, and the importance of, of play and joy, and realizing, I think, that the body is not just a, a container for the mind. Um, the body is, is a source of wisdom in itself. 
and there's an intelligence in the body. And one of the things I learned in theater that we say, and that I know from interplay as well, is that the body never lies. The body never lies, and so it will always tell you what's going on with you. And part of our challenge is to notice, uh, pay attention to what is happening. And our bodies will always tell us what's going on. And when we don't pay attention is when we kind of go off track and, can, and become ill, and uh, it, that contributes to it. There was a time in my life when I couldn't breathe well. I had pneumonia, which I contracted overseas when I was dancing with friends in Africa, in Malawi, with an interplay group. I came home with pneumonia and almost died from it. And that is not an exaggeration. I was in the hospital. I had surgeries. I was, on, uh, I was intubated and in a coma for a month. And so I could not breathe on my own. And the funny thing about being in a coma is that you actually are aware of some things that are happening around you. And so I was aware of my breath. And I became aware of every single breath and the importance of that. And as I became stronger and survived, and it was clear that I was going to survive, um, just the sheer gift of being able to take a breath impressed itself on me that I could, that I was alive. Breathing, to breathe in and to breathe out always brings me to uh, a calm center. So when, if I'm, if I'm in the midst of chaos, I'm able to take a step back and consciously think, okay, just breathe. Take a deep breath because, and we know physiologically that when you breathe in and out, you take those deep breaths, it literally changes um, what's happening within your body and you're able to become calm. And so breath is fundamental to our awareness, to um, staying in the moment, and it's, it's just the heartbeat of life. One of the most important things I've learned so far in my life is that being comes before doing. Being comes before doing. What that means for me is that finding those practices and those that desire to be centered in my life and taking that time to develop my present, my awareness of the present moment develops a depth of character from which springs action. So we can dance around and be, and do lots of stuff. But if it's not connected to the depth of our being, if it's not coming from a center of love and compassion, then it can easily go off track. But being, when we take the time to develop that sense from there, we move into action in the world that's deeply connected, I think, that makes a strong difference. So, being before doing. There is so much in each and every single human being. I feel we were all created for a purpose. And so, for me, the ultimate role is to live deep and bring forth for the world who I am to the best of my ability, to grow, to learn, to change, to find out, to discover, to take risks, to be scared, to do it anyway. I feel this ultimate role is 
to bring the fullness of who we are as individuals to the earth, to bring the fullness of who we are to the planet. If we only live on the surface and only consume, it's a very passive way to live. So the more I serve others, the more I find that uh, way of being kind in anything. I am creating myself, but it's always connected with others. There's always that dance of relationship. Um, so I'm not on the earth alone. And that service is of service to humanity in small and perhaps large ways. But I do think that everything we do matters. I think sweeping the floors and washing the dishes are, or can be a great service. Anything that we do, I think, done with the attitude of care and concern and help for one another is service. And I, for me, being human is not just living for myself. In order to understand who I am, I need to be in connection with others. And I find myself in community. One of the great gifts of life, I think, is art in all of its forms. And the, when we look at a piece of art, no matter what it is, or we experience it, if it's music or dance or great literature, is that there's a, a sense of timelessness about it. The very idea of myth is something that speaks to something beyond and draws us forward. So we begin, the deepest parts of ourself, I think, resonate with great art. Um, that there's something in it that speaks to the parts of our soul that we may not be able to access right away. You know, something captures us, and uh, I think that is the role of beauty, too. When, when you see something that's beautiful, you know, it takes your breath away. And you cannot always put into words what that is that draws you in, but it touches you in some way, and it brings forth something in you that maybe you didn't realize was there. And so in that way, art in all of its forms and beauty in so many different ways that we find beauty in the world, um, really reaches us deep inside and is, is kind of a reflection. The reason we can recognize it is that it's in us. That beauty, that, that depth is in us. And we need great art and we need these ways of being able to see the beautiful in order to realize more and more of who we are. And so when we have access to these beautiful things and we can create these beautiful things, then that's reaching a depth of, uh, of who we are that we're giving the world, that we're able to give as a gift to others. Um, there are times that we can find beauty we can find beauty in the most simple of things. We don't have to go to art museums and we, you don't have to lot of stuff around you, you know. Uh, the, the, the great beauty of uh, that's in the natural world is something that's available to us all the time. If we take the time to see it, to pay attention, to be in the present moment with it, I think some of that is, is looking deeply and listening deeply, to be able to be still with that peace. And the more we are able to be still and really absorb and, and to resonate with it, um, the more it, it can grow for us.
Gratitude is fundamental. I wake up every morning and as soon as I'm, my eyes open, I say, thank you. I'm awake. I'm alive. Thank you. When I take my glass of water, thank you. I have access to clean water in my kitchen and I have my whole life. I have traveled to places and been with people who don't. I'm very aware of the preciousness of fresh, clean water and how easily I can obtain it. Gratitude, even for the difficulties, because it's those difficulties and that suffering that there is always, I have found much to my dismay, which I would prefer not to have the suffering, but in the suffering, I have always found a gift somewhere. You know, the poet Mary Oliver, she says, someone I once loved gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that that too was gift. And so everything is gratitude, even the sorrow. I think it's more important today than ever to have an intentional interior life because I think the challenges today are great with all the screens. Oh my gosh, all the little screens and big screens and sit in a room with a huge screen and here's a screen in your pocket and um, it's everywhere and all the distractions are everywhere and we kind of live outside of ourselves out there. And when we do that, I think we're living on, on the surface of life. You know, we're just kind of bouncing around and from one thing to another to another to another and the ability to hold a focus is more and more of a challenge. And so I think, I think we have to decide what kind of life do I want to lead? What kind of person do I want to be? What kind of, um, what, what do I want to bring forth into the world? Deep listening is when we have given another our full attention. And I think it's kind of rare these days, right? We are so distracted with everything. And uh, one of the things I've learned in my work life everywhere, not only here, but everywhere, is that people don't listen, people don't read very much <laughs> or very well. It's like bing, 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 one thing after another. No, listen. Um, so deep listening, um, there, someone once said that deep listening is so close to being loved that most people can't tell the difference. So when you listen deeply, you are fully present to the other person without interrupting them. Letting their thoughts, just receiving them and listening and giving them your full attention is so precious. It is the greatest gift we can give another human being is to be fully present to them and listen to them without adding our own thoughts. To make a decision and think about what do I want to do and how do I want to be means that we have to pay attention. You have to pay attention and create that life for yourself. Because without paying attention, we will constantly bounce from one thing to another and not be anchored in anything, not have the depth of character to create the best that we can bring forth into the world. So when we have an intentional interior life, we're saying, I am honoring myself. I am honoring the dignity of my life. I am paying attention to um, this gift of life that I hold and develop 
to bring forth. So an intentional interior life, I think, is crucial for joy, for happiness, for uh, how to find our way in, in all of the challenges and the pain and suffering as well for life. I think what's really important is to make time for stillness. It's the opposite of the bouncing and distraction. And stillness, I think, is the cornerstone of an interior life, to be able to find and, I and make the space for stillness. We have to choose it, I think. And that can mean many different kinds of things. We can learn and practice and uh, every day, as, as I, I practice <laughs> every day, um, to sit in stillness with no distractions. So that could, you could do that for five minutes, you could do it for 20 minutes. I do a practice for 20 minutes every morning of just simply sitting in stillness. And by doing that, we become, the first thing that happens is you become aware of what you're thinking because, right, we never stop thinking. And when that happens, you go, oh, yeah, I'm thinking, oh, okay, let that go. The thoughts are always there, it's okay, just let it go. And it's an always, it's a return to stillness. When you notice a thought, oh, return. And that constant returning makes us stronger to be able to choose stillness. And the more we do that, the more space we have. It, it's kind of like a, there's more space in my head. There's more silence. Uh, there aren't a thousand thoughts all the time. So making an intentional practice of being in stillness and cultivating that, whether you begin with a few minutes or 20 minutes every day, is important, but we can, we can sneak it in, you know. We can, we can sneak that in by doing things like, um, if you have a, a cell phone, is to turn off the notifications. Don't let it ping you every second, you know, which takes our attention all these places. Um, with social media, you want to be on social media, great, decide. I'm going to spend 15 minutes on social media and then I'm going to go off. You know? um, I, I have a friend who puts a cell phone in her pocket um, and just takes a walk around the block and refuses to take it out of her pocket. So it's finding those little ways in which we can slow down. If we don't slow down, We'll never find a way to rest in stillness. And for me, that's a big part of it. So returning to the present and returning to uh, becoming awake to the present moment is key, I think. What, what is happening right in front of you right now is where you're living. Ultimately, what I love is the source of love itself. That one of the things that I sit with every day, when I sit in my stillness, it's um, a sense of contemplating, contemplating this mystery. And I feel and sense that as a source of love and so when I sit, my intention is always um, just to be. Be with that love. And allow myself to receive it, that love and to love in return. I don't know what that means exactly, but I feel it. And I practice that every day and I find that the more I sit with that intention of receiving and giving love, 
the more I grow, the more depth I feel within myself, and hopefully the softer, kinder heart I become. Sometimes I feel like I don't know who I am anymore compared to who I thought I was. And yet I feel myself with I am in a bigger way, in a, in a more expansive way. Um, so there's a lot of letting go. Um, and being filled with um, a sense of trust in that. That's a really important aspect of what happens. I'm detaching from myself. I'm detaching from having this uh, identity that's specific. I'm detaching from uh, the need to control what I can and trusting that I am flowing with this source. I am detaching from judgment of others, of myself. I feel it's a constant emptying, kind, kind of a constant self-emptying and just letting go, letting go, letting go. Again, trying to make something happen is an ego thing, right? So letting go of that ego is I'm going to trust that the more I do this, the more I let go, the more the self lets go. So it's within that context of relationship. And that's all I know so far. What I've learned so far is that for me, in, it is not a matter of uh, effort and trying. I'm going to let go of myself, <laughs> you know. Um, it's quite the opposite. And the scary part, the scary part is, is to be able to, is to just do the work of sitting and trusting that love that is there, that I feel this, uh, that I'm sitting with, and, and the letting go, because the more I try to strive to do something, I cannot have an agenda. In those moments, there is no agenda other than the love. And I have found that it is that love that transforms. It is that love that I am receiving that transforms my heart that transforms who I am, who wants to, to try to make things happen. And even if I'm going to make myself let go, you know, the, the love itself transforms and softens me and allows me to let go in a very gentle way, in a way that I can handle. I have the sense that um, living my everyday life is something that I feel um, uh, this connection in a way that is, it's always, you know, it's kind of like the hidden mystery. You know, we can see what is around us, but somehow, and, and even throughout ancient times, people have sensed that there's something a little beyond, that, there, that there's a hiddenness about a reality that's beyond, just beyond what we can see. Sometimes we call it a veil, you know, like the veil has, be, it's beyond the veil. <laughs> For me, what I feel is a, uh, a sense of longing and a yearning to be connected. To know that I'm not alone in the universe. That despite everyone around me sometimes and I can still feel alone, I also feel that, that my, my interior, my inner 
landscape is, is reaching out for a deeper sense of connection. And I, I think I've always felt that there's something uh, beyond, uh, beyond what I can see, beyond my senses. And so I, it, it's like a, a lifting of my heart and my, my desire uh, for that connection, for that relationship. Um, and I find a place where I can rest in, in that sense of knowingness and, and a sense of love and, and care uh, that I can sometimes feel and believe in. Um, and so that kind of reaching out, um, it, it, all, it all comes down to relationship. There are many ways to pray. And I think growing in a deep spirituality is about discovering all the different ways that we can connect deeply with that which we have no words for, right? The great mystery, this ultimate reality that is so hard to describe. So there are many prayers with words that we know and can find, and th that's great. But again, our bodies are a source of awareness that when we pay attention, that our very breath can become a prayer. We do not need words to pray. And I think for me, that was the thing I began to discover in my life. Um, I don't need words to pray. I can just lift my heart and my breath and uh, with this, this yearning for connection. And that comes through the body. So even something as simple as a gesture can be a prayer when there is music and, and we, we move and dance and swirl, that can be a prayer. So everything about us can be prayer in a way that connects deeply within us, you know, beyond these words. Um, so that, that words become a part of being able to pray, but yet movement itself, the very breath of life, is a prayer to God. To tap into the authenticness with your own sense of humility, I think is, uh, for me, I know there was some point in my life when my prayer life switched to that, where I, I left behind, not behind, but I, I, you know, I put over there. <laughs> a lot of things I had learned. And I just asked for help one day. I remember that so clearly. It was just, help! <laughs> help! <laughs> and it was like the floodgates opened. I don't know. Uh, it was wonderful in that I recognized within myself that it was an authentic, heartfelt, I think it's about being authentic, being honest with yourself, and bringing that, um, that sense of uh, not having any pretense, maybe not using anybody else's words, but just your honest and authentic sense of what is happening within you to your um, thought, to your request, to your desire, to your yearning. And when we tap into that, um, you know, it's like uh, you, you just kind of pray all the time. Actually, I think, um, I'm actually very excited about quantum physics. <laughs> I think quantum physics is fascinating. And I think there's a lot that folks who 
uh, swim in the waters of world religions and and um, uh, meditation and prayer just um, can can resonate with quantum physics. Quantum physics tells us that you know everything. Uh, uh, what appears to be matter is energy, and energy can become matter, and and uh, and so I think there's a great, uh, a growing sense um, in the world of the uh, kind of oneness of humanity. That when there's a certain sense, if we only look at externals, we'll see all the differences, which are important and beautiful. And yet, we are, uh, we are human beings. And in, in all of the inter-religious encounters I've been involved in, the, the really exciting thing for me is that uh, for so many of us, we relate on that level of our common humanity, which means that there is a basic goodness in us, I believe. Um, and we see it in people who have their, whatever their daily practices are, that there's a, a developing sense that we notice each other in the, rel in the, in the realms of uh, compassion and loving kindness and care for one another. So on the, on the levels of that is where we do resonate and see and care for one another, that the, the connections between us are really, really deep. And I'm aware that with all these world religions, we, um, there is what has become known as this golden rule, which is basically to um, love your neighbor as yourself. It's in, it's in all, all of the major religions, all of them. And so the folks who practice that within their tradition, however that manifests, we recognize each other, we see each other. It's like, oh, yes, you know that too. You believe that too. We believe this too, and we work together then. That sense of oneness is, when you say, love your neighbor as yourself, it's not just, oh, my neighbor over there you realize, oh, my neighbor over there is me. I am my neighbor over there. We have and we are the same underneath it all. And so for me, that is the, the great thing about the interreligious work are the personal encounters, the personal relationships that um, I've come to know with people across traditions where that is the basis, that is the basis, that caring for one another and the kindness and, and compassion for one another is first and foremost. And so when we come from that source, that base, um, you know, we have respect for traditions but together we can see that our humanity, um, that there is a oneness about it um, that is common to us. I so value my uh, relationships with our Buddhist friends and from the dialogue I've been involved in for quite a number of years now. And one thing I, uh, many things we share, I share with them, is this desire to cultivate compassion and loving kindness. Cultivating compassion and loving kindness, I think, is, is part of that sense of being, but it's a ground, it's a foundation on which I move in the world. And I have learned that kindness matters. Every single instance of kindness matters in the world because love is all there is. I feel that world religions are the keepers of ancient wisdom in a way that 
they are deep wells that we continually go to to learn in every generation. So across the board, there is truly great spiritual um, knowledge and wisdom and experience that is still very vibrant and vital to us today. Religion itself, I think oh, that's a, a word that uh, one could argue semantics about, right? Um, but I understand it as that which is a, a set of beliefs and practices um, that are um, within a particular community that are passed on, they're shared beliefs. Uh, it's not an individual kind of thing. And within these shared practices, people create um, worship and ritual in their ways of understanding and being in the world, certain structures. And so all of those things can and uh, be beneficial in so many ways. Um, great religions uh, have structures and encourage people to care for one another in, in health care and education and all kinds of things. So I know with the parliament, it's, it's not only people who belong to certain religions who are a part of it and part of organizing and presenting and attending, but it's people who may have no particular religious path but consider themselves deeply spiritual. It's about relationship. It is, uh, for me, a sense of connection that there is a dynamic and a resonance and, and a looking more deeply into something that sparks that uh, awareness and recognition within me. It's kind of a way of being. It, if you're that kind of person, if you attend a parliament, oh my gosh, there's, uh, there's so much. It, it's a huge tent. And everyone is welcome there with the understanding of respect and a kind of a non-proselytizing environment. So it uh, is able to be an, an opportunity to encounter people completely different from you and to learn. There is a great deal of wisdom and support there can be in, in religions as well. Um, and I think uh, what's really important, too, is understanding that a certain respect for diverse opinions, diverse beliefs, is key. It's vital for sustaining life on our planet that we need to respect that people will have different opinions um, and different ways of describing and understanding this, this mystery <laughs> that we're aware of but manifests in different ways. So we are, are within the structure of the Catholic Church and with a specialized ministry. This shrine is started way back in 1911 as a, a worshiping community, a Catholic community. This church itself was built in 1923. So all the beautiful artistic things that you see here, the statues and the stained glass windows are a reflection of the uh, Italian immigrants that came in their culture from southern Italy and Sicily. So for about 86 years or so, this was a, a parish. And when demographics changed and, and neighborhoods changed, um, the archdiocese decided it needed to close. And so they did close it, but the people um, partitioned Cardinal Bernadine at the time, uh, literally marching in the streets. We have photographs of people with big signs, Save Our Lady of Pompeii, and uh, uh, Cardinal Bernadine decided to save it, but in a different kind of ministry. So as a shrine, he reopened it. So we have Sunday Masses, we, have, we celebrate all the big seasons of Advent and Christmas and Lent. Uh, and Easter, and our ministry is a little more specialized for people who want to explore their spiritual lives a little more deeply. So the shrine 
is a place of pilgrimage. You know, we're not a parish. People have to make a special effort to come here. So we consider anyone who comes to the shrine to be a pilgrim. And so by coming here, we know they are on an interior journey. We are unique in that way. Um, so it's like a retreat when you come here.